Hello, and welcome to Wild Sessions. I'm Henrietta Norton, a parent, nutritional practitioner, author, and founder of Wild Nutrition. In this series, I'll be sitting down with some excellent professionals who will share their depth of knowledge and back it all up with practical advice. I'll also be sharing real-life experiences from women and men who have navigated the twists and turns of health at every life stage. So we are in the car on our way to meet Alicia Drummond. Alicia was one of the first people that I thought of to interview actually when we were setting up this podcast because Alicia is a psychologist who specializes in adolescent mental well-being and she is also the founder of Teen Tips which is a fantastic resource for parents and schools on how to support teenagers and adolescents. If anybody hasn't heard of it go check it out it's absolutely incredible. And a few weeks ago, I was reading about a study that had come out that shown that anxiety in adolescents and teenage years had increased by 70% in the last 30 years, which I just found shocking. And I thought that that would be a really great topic to unpick with Alicia, to understand exactly what's happening with the body, why is this exponential growth occurring, and what we as parents can do about it. And the great thing about Alicia is that not only is she clinically brilliant, she is also a parent herself. So I am really excited to hear about what she has got to share. So I am quite literally sitting around the kitchen table with lovely Alicia Drummond, who is a psychotherapist and founder of Teen Tips. Welcome, Alicia. Hello, it's very lovely to be with you. Everything that I seem to be reading is pointing to the fact that there's this exponential rise in anxiety, and most especially in teenagers, at a time when there's su- such rapid growth anyway, isn't there, physically and physiologically, so for them to be navigating anxiety as well. It's a shocker. Yeah. What was it about adolescent mental well-being that made you want to specialise in that area? Okay, so I qualified as a psychotherapist in 2009. I did a lot of training in parenting and that kind of grew. So I ended up doing huge amounts of staff training in schools. And by 2017, I think it was working in about 160 schools. My car looked like some mobile cafe bin. (laughs) And um, we just thought, we need to do this slightly differently. So we then... Work, I worked with one of the schools that we work with a lot, the King's School up in Chester, to produce an online parenting course, which is based on a four-hour course that I've been work, running for a long time. And then we did one for staff. And then, of course, COVID hits and, you know, you're not going into schools anymore, but we went online. So we had about 4,500 people on webinars between the end of March and the end of May last oh, year incredible. so that's actually perfectly illustrating demand for it and the need for people to feel some sense of guidance around mental well-being and how to support their children issues that are already occurring with their children was there a specific theme around it was it around say anxiety which I know we're going to talk about more today but was there anything that was it was, it was really interesting, actually. I think when we started, we did various surveys as we went through the year last year. And at first, everybody was really worried about the online, you know, the online world, which wasn't surprising because suddenly they're all spending a lot more time online. Then really, by the time we got to September, October, um, they were much more worried about mental health. Um, by December it was anxiety by February this year it was motivation because a lot of them young Mm. ones have just kept going kept going and then lost the will a bit so it was interesting how parental perspective changed but always at the top of the list in the surveys after that first one with the screens from there on in it was all about mental health and Mm. well-being Mm. so a lot of people really worried about them. So it's exaggerated what was really a growing concern and then COVID accentuated that. And so for anybody that has been doing any reading about the increase in in mental well-being, for anybody that's listening with children, are there any sort of signs of anxiety? Because anxiety is a kind of plethora of different disorders, isn't it? Yeah. So is there anything in particular that people should be looking out for in their children? 
I think mental health wise, there has been a massive increase. So we can't deny that. You know, if you look 2017, there were one in nine children and young people had a problem with mental health. And that now as of 2020 one is one children. in six. And now it's one in six. Children and adolescents, so young people. Yeah. And it's now That's one in shocking. six. Yeah. So it's really shocking. So anxiety being a sort of presentation of, of fear then and feeling threatened, whatever that might be in their environment. I mean, there are fears by age. It's normal for six-year-olds to be frightened of the dark. We all experience anxiety from time to time. It's in reaction to a perceived threat. And our brains have evolved over millennium to mm. be on the scan for opportunity or for threat. So it's a normal human reaction. If your child was becoming overly anxious, sometimes it will manifest in anger because if you think about it, anxiety is part of the fight or flight response. So those who are fighters might come across as being overly aggressive. If they're the flighters, they'll be wanting to run away from whatever it is that's really frightening them. So you might see them, as I say, becoming more aggressive, becoming more withdrawn, avoiding certain situations and circumstances. They might become more clingy, trouble sleeping. There's lots and lots of things to look out for. And actually, you said something about adolescence can start much earlier now isn't it being defined as starting at something like eight years old yes we always used to think adolescence you know 12 to 20 and that was it but actually we know now that there are lots of girls for example getting their periods around eight a lot of the hormonal changes which you'll know more about than I will are occurring younger and I don't know whether that is about change in our diet or what it is but it is happening so we know it can start anywhere from eight and all the latest research from the world of neuroscience tells us that you don't have the brain of an adult till your mid-twenties. So it's wow. a lot longer wow. than we ever thought. Yeah. So, yes, the number of children seeking help has gone through the roof. As a therapist, it's kind of like watching a tsunami coming at you across the hill. We just get so many inquiries. And the problem is that the system is not there to pick up the pieces. Mm. So CAMS, which is your child and adolescent mental health service, at the moment, only a third of those who are referred to CAMS end up getting treatment. And if it's a real emergency, it might be four weeks, but it could be anything between four, 12, and even longer for your first assessment. Well, that's a very long time. When you're experiencing anxiety and exactly. you're your parent to a child who's experiencing anxiety. Yeah. So it's a fantastic service. There's amazing people in it but it is simply not up to the job of coping with what we're dealing with at the moment. And if you were to put your stake in the ground of what you think might be contributing to this? I think you know, the whole of last year in terms of the isolation, uh, loneliness, the developmental drive of adolescence is to start to separate from your family and attach to your friends. And of course, lockdown mm. just drove everybody mm. in the opposite direction. Mm. And that was OK for most and for some, it was fantastic, particularly those um, on the autistic spectrum found it really actually very calm being able to learn at home rather than perhaps being in school for many. I mean, I'm generalising, but for many of them. So I don't think that's helped at all. I think the concerns about the future, you know, and things like eco-anxiety. Why wouldn't you be anxious about the future of the planet when you hear endless statistics on the news about you know global well, it's warming absolutely and it's it's interesting where information can become power but it can also be debilitating if you know too much of it at a time when perhaps you don't have the developed capacity yet to rationalize it or process it yeah. it can feel overwhelming and you know even as an adult particularly if you're on social media you know you're bombarded with information and things to think about and process and question yourself about yeah. Well, I think the other thing that we have to think about is that the safeguarding systems within schools are much, much more robust than they ever were, which is fantastic. But it also means that teachers are signposting children towards the safeguarding leads. And sometimes it's a medicalisation of a normal response. Mm. So if a child is anxious about exams, well actually they need to understand that it can be quite useful to be a little bit anxious going mm. into an exam because situational stress makes us perform better. Mm. 
we have to be careful that we're not just panicking and sending them towards help left, right and centre, mm. when actually it would be better for them if we were really, really calm because anxiety is a bit like I've got this ball of anxiety and I chuck it at you and now you've got it. And if the adults are chucking it down the generation then it's really not helpful. That's a really interesting conversation that could be a whole podcast in itself. I would love to understand a little bit more about what is going on underneath the skin of a teenager. We now understand science is showing us that the mind controls the body. But the body also, and I think the teenage years are a really good illustration of this, where the the body actually does also control the mind. So the physiological biochemical changes so that's all the the chemicals that are naturally produced in your body start changing the amounts that are produced during your teenage years that influences how teenagers can feel as well so what exactly is happening underneath the surface in the teenage brain and body well the teenage brain is a truly fascinating place to have on the rummage because it is completely (laughs) different to any other point in your life so it all kind of really starts around about 11 for the girls 12 for the boys so the boys are about a year behind most of the way through and it's a time of cognitive restructuring so we're getting rid of uh, lots and lots of the neurons brain cells Uh, that we're not kind of using and we're making super highway connections between the different parts of the brain so for example the prefrontal cortex which is your higher thinking frontal lobes that's what we use to read other people's facial expressions to assess risk and outcome to control our impulsive behavior to control emotion and outburst but it's the last part of the brain to get its adult brain wiring. So for a 14, 15 year old, actually being able to interpret your facial expressions and tone of voice is really quite difficult. So the peer group's really, really important because it's where they feel safe. But if you're not very good at reading social cues, it's easy to misinterpret how other people are responding to you, which is why there's often a lot of social drama because they want to attach the peer group but there's that fear am I going to be criticized am I going to be rejected am I going to be judged and so it's a sort of toxic combination they're hypersensitive and they're not very good at reading them either so it's difficult for them to see perspective so from a brain perspective there's a huge amount going on they are wired for novelty and excitement and they get a bigger buzz out of anything than we would do so that is also unhelpful that's quite an unnerving space for them to be in as well isn't it to feel slightly out of control of their own feelings and their own reactions and so the more that we can say it's okay Mm -hmm. eventually it's like that sort of pendulum isn't it eventually it will start coming back into the middle again and finding some balance yeah But I think also we're, as parents, quite often alarmed when they're having really strong emotions. So we try very hard to bump them out of it or stop it. And actually, for them to learn that the quickest way out of any feeling is straight through the middle of it Mm. is really important. But we don't allow them often to feel their feelings because we feel uncomfortable. Can we talk more about the environment around them? So at the beginning, you said that they can be triggered or calmed by their environment. And actually, you said about tweaking the environment around can actually shift a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You're talking holistically, I assume, about what they're exposed to in sort of parenting, family, schools, peers. But also, would you build diet and sleep into that as well? Absolutely. I'm permanently banging onto them about the need to get really good sleep because if you have poor sleep, you have higher cortisol levels the following night, which means you get a worse night's sleep than following night. And it kind of is that spiral. And, you know, sleep deprivation, I mean, it's a form of torture in some... some yeah. It's not Isn't good it for us. Yes, <laughs> it tells anybody who's really ever had well. a child will know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so sleep is massively important. Diet, I mean, I know that's your area, so I wouldn't deign to tiptoe on there, but if you've got a poor gut microbiome, you've got higher levels of cortisol in the brain so absolutely and the irony of whatever game nature was playing because at that stage in their life all they want to do is eat sugar and salt Mm -hmm. and processed foods because it's that part of the brain that wants the instant reward gut health is so important what's one of the biggest threats to gut health is processed foods salt sugars and actually it's also stimulating that stress response that 
change in blood sugar levels means that they can't concentrate as well, they get moody, it affects their skin, digestion, and it means that the body is always working in a slight state of recovery, recovering that balance, that equilibrium, which triggers the release of the stress hormone. So it becomes this kind of self-perpetuating cycle. And sleep, I think, is a really interesting one because even though my area is in diet one of the first things that I'd say with everybody is are you getting enough sleep because if you don't get enough sleep then you have more tendency to reach towards stimulants the next day and sugary foods. I was reading a study recently that looked at blue light so we are going to talk about social media and digital connection because obviously that's the thing that cops the blame for everything that's going wrong with the world but one of the things that it was looking at was whether or not exposure to blue light from screens like tablets or phones impacts on sleep so if they're looking at a blue light device before they go to sleep is it affecting how well the body produces melatonin which is a a hormone that has a really really important role in regulating all sorts of things, including energy, mood, the immune system. It works in over 700 different functions in the body, so it's, it's incredibly important. And this study showed that when you have just 45 minutes of exposure to a blue light device, that it reduced your melatonin production by 80%, Yeah, which is huge. Yeah, huge. You know, I read that and thought, in the summer holidays, my eldest fell asleep with his phone nearly every night. And I swore that would never be the case. I swore that would never be the case. I feel like I've been slightly weathered down, worn down by the last year and a half. I'm going to use that as an excuse. COVID's going to get the the blame for a lot of things for a long time yet. But it just struck me that millions of teenagers around the world, and, and people actually, humans, using their blue light device before they go to bed. So leading on to the impact of social connection through a digital device of some sort, Some people say that it's the connection that you get online is as strong as the connection that you get in person. And then some people very much beg to differ. And I'd love to know what you think about social media, digital connection. I mean, over the last year, it would have been an utter disaster for teenagers without it because that disconnect was bad enough as it was. And I think that's causing lots of problems now. But actually... You have to remember, you get a different chemical release when you're face-to-face with somebody. So when you're with somebody, you get the touchy-feely oxytocin, which you don't get online. So, Mm. yes, there's lots and lots of pros for it. And, you know, there's evidence that kind of some gaming will increase their fine motor skills and brain speed and all of that kind of stuff. But it's about everything. everything. You've got to keep it in balance. They need to be having face-to-face communication amongst other people if you look at what the job markets of the future predict our kids are going to need top of the list is good social skills and social skills are something that you need to learn with people of different generations it's not enough just to be communicating via gaming because actually when you hear them communicating via gaming, quite a lot of it isn't stuff you would ever think you could translate into a boardroom, <laughs> frankly. Um, so I think it's just about everything. You know, you, as parents, you're up against it because the way that all of these games are made in Silicon Valley, you know, they bring in the psychologists. They know exactly how to manipulate the kind of dopamine cycles well, in the this brain. Is it. Exactly. And the fact that you know, it's built not to have any pause. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I I would love to say that we had a beautiful childhood skipping through fields and it was all very <laughs> idyllic and nowadays it's look at you know, I I have to hold myself back from actually being that kind of parent because actually that's not helpful or true, actually. Yeah. But one of the things that we did have is we had a lot more social connection and less time on devices. And so when the children are saying yes, yes, yes to gaming and being on screens, they're also saying no to other things. So no to physical exercise, no to being outside. And I just wonder how important exercise is for a teenager who might be experiencing anxiety or being in nature. 
It's hugely important. I mean, 20 minutes of exercise stabilizes your cortisol for about 24 hours. So, That's so interesting. And does it matter where it is, what you're doing? No, no it just, just needs to be outside. ideally being outside because the connection with nature is really important as well. You know, our brain loves that kind of soothing being in nature moment and again there's a chemical release that goes on there cortisol is the main hormone that's involved with the anxiety response i think one of the things we can do with young people is to help them to find their healthy coping strategies for me i either swim every morning or i walk every morning and then before i go to bed i'll always have a hot bath and read a book and if i get those two things in i know that that boosts the parasympathetic nervous system which is the rest and digest system Mm. and anything that happens between the two you know whatever your cortisol is doing during the day because stress happens then it goes down and then something else happens and then it stops if you have a start and a finish actually you you put your system back into balance that's such great advice for anybody and I imagine with adolescents it's finding actually what works for them it also builds in those daily pauses which just seem to be lacking in our very busy frenetic modern life that we have and us talking about social media and the games are constant there's never an end to them it just keeps going keeps going there's no natural pause I mean, that's why TikTok's so pernicious. It's the short form video, very fast scrolling. And yeah. that's what makes it so addictive. So yeah. I think as parents, it's just about being aware of what they're doing, you know, and not stopping it because ultimately they need to learn to be responsible digital citizens. And you're not going to learn that if you don't use anything. Yeah. Is there any sort of ring fencing you would advise around it, though? Is there a sort of cut-off point that you would recommend? Not for an hour before bedtime. And I would say, you know, put in... You can't have it before X time in the morning because otherwise you get the younger ones thinking, oh, I could just sneak downstairs before anybody's awake and they'll be up at five in the morning and they'll have done three hours of gaming before you've even woken up. And then I think rather than saying, right, you can have it for an hour and 20 minutes, which is a nightmare because now you've got to police it is actually just saying, right, we don't have it at this time, we don't have it this time, we don't have it at meal times. So you put in segments of the day where screens are just not an option. And I would say to them, look, provided you're getting a decent amount of exercise, provided you're talking to people in real time, provided you're engaging with a family in whatever format that might be and doing hobbies and all the rest of it, provided you can keep your life in balance, I really don't have a problem with your screen time. Mm. Unless, of course, you're kind of busy off watching x-rated porn at which point i might want to have another think about it yeah Yeah. but on the whole if you're managing it you're keeping yourself safe and you're doing it as part of a balanced life it's fine i wouldn't give you a plate of chips for every meal if you can show me you can balance out the plate then you don't need my intervention unless it goes wrong at which point i'm here if you need me And if somebody who has a child with anxiety who is using the phone or that kind of world to retreat to, is there any advice on that or awareness for that teenager to know that sometimes that can heighten anxiety rather than quell it? Yeah. I mean, I always say to them, what do you think the most common emotion felt by people using social media is? And the answer is envy. So why would you put yourself into a position using a gadget that ultimately is probably going to make you feel inadequate compared to other people so i think a lot of the studies will show that 20 minutes of social media scrolling is actually quite good in terms of happiness but it goes down after that so short sharp bursts rather than long scrolly scrolly times is is a good thing and uh, i think just rather than telling asking them you know well how do you find you feel after What do you notice the difference between using it for 20 minutes and using it for an hour? So getting them thinking for themselves. Can that be applied to us? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. And if you were to give your top three tips to a parent who might be listening, who's got a child who's experiencing anxiety, what would you say the three things to look for to do? um, I think the first one is for you to be very calm when children are tiny they can't do something called self-regulation so they do co-regulation so co-regulation is kind of we lend them our prefrontal cortex so that they can calm themselves down and that's why we do with babies you know you touch them and you look them in the eye contact and you you make little kind of cooey noises 
And they gradually develop the ability to self-regulate, to calm themselves down, although it does get a bit out of the window during adolescence, which we'll come on to, (laughs) Um, kind of towards five, six. But when the stress goes up, so when they become anxious, that becomes really difficult again. So you need to go back into that process. Try and get a little bit of contact. So even if, if they won't let you give them a hug, sometimes you can just get shoulder to shoulder. So contact is really soothing. Eye contact all those, oh, I know, oh, lots of empathy when they're in the middle of the panic because they're not in their thinking brain, they're in their, they're in their emotional limbic brain, so they're not going to be so able giving, to calm down. not giving them the, it will be okay, no. it's, you know, no. you shouldn't feel like this, it's no. more that that sounds really yeah. hard or, yeah. yeah. Do you know what, I can see you're really, really struggling at the moment, what do you need from me? I don't know what I need from you. Okay, well, sometimes I find that when I feel really, really stressed or anxious, just uh, sitting outside or running my hands under warm water or having a cuddle really helps. But in the heat of the moment, don't try problem solving. It's completely pointless. They can't hear you, literally. Uh, So you allow them to calm down. And that's actually also really important when it comes to anxiety because anxiety comes in a big wave and you feel like you're going up and up and up and up and I'm not going to be able to cope any longer. But actually, if you can just learn to sit with it, you will find that you start to come down the other side. And anybody who's had a panic attack, it's so frightening that often they start to develop a fear of the fear. So they're frightened of having another panic attack. So you kind of lose sight of what you were originally scared of. Mm So there's a really good app called Clear Fear, which I recommend because it's a very good way for helping them to learn to ride the waves. So I think that not backing away from things as well, so not letting them constantly not do things that they're frightened of, because actually when you do that, you reinforce the idea that there's something that they need to be frightened of. If your child says there's a monster under the bed, do not go looking for it. Because if you go looking for it, you reinforce the idea that it might be there in the first place. So we don't want to create monsters where there are no monsters. You know, actually the message we want to be giving them is, you know, no, there's nothing to fear here. But your brain seems to think there is. So how do you think we could work together to kind of get you out the other side of that? And it's, it's their engagement in their sort of recovery so that you're doing it together that I can imagine is is empowering them increasing their awareness of themselves as well yeah because when you go into that anxiety space you feel like you don't have any control Mm. so if we can gradually give them a sense that actually they can start to recognize their triggers they can start to understand and you you talked about that mind body connection you know i'll say to them what is the first thing you feel in your body because i think Many of us have become kind of disconnected from the neck down. You know, we're just not listening to the feedback. And the feedback gives us massive clues. So, oh, I know if I start to get butterflies. Oh, okay. What's going on in this year? Why am I feeling like this? And you can start to to be more proactive in recognising what your triggers are and also getting in before the fight or flight kicks in big time. Because once it's gone, you're, you know... You're kind of out of action for probably 20 minutes. Is that how long it takes to come roughly, back down? Roughly, yeah. Usually it peaks around 11 to 13 minutes. It's an amazing response. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. really clever, intelligent response of the body, isn't it? I mean, it's just, mm. it's when we stay in that heightened state that that's when it becomes detrimental yeah. to the body. And if we don't have those pauses in our day, which you, you know, you've, yeah. you've already highlighted, we can't ever really come back down if we're not mm-hmm. getting enough sleep if we're not eating well if we're not finding those pauses in our day then we constantly stay in this yeah. hyper aroused state and i think for them understanding that absolutely not one single one of the symptoms of fight or flight is going to ultimately cause you damage because you know when you're hyperventilating and you feel like you can't breathe you might think you're going to stop breathing but you're not mm. when your heart's going like the clappers you might think oh my god i'm gonna have a heart attack but you're not mm. so if you have one panic attack it's always worth going to the gp and getting it checked out just to make sure there's nothing wrong with your heart or anything else but beyond that it's understanding this is all part of a normal response that is actually designed to protect me And your third tip? It's a protective response. Learn to ride the waves and expose, don't avoid, wherever possible would be my... 
top three. But perhaps more important than all of that, from a parental perspective, is for you to stay really calm because they need to borrow your calm. That's a really lovely way of putting it, borrow your calm. I love that. And that's a really important point because we're talking about what we can do for the child, but actually it's our self-care and what we're doing for ourselves to ensure that we can be there wholeheartedly in a grounded way for our children as well. And so I would imagine that some of the advice that you've given is also stuff that we can apply to ourselves. 100%. Yeah. All of it. Yeah, really all of it. And even though sometimes you may feel that it's you as a parent that needs to be there in their point of crisis, sometimes it's actually about you stepping away from it so that you can come back into it if you feel that you're beginning to ride it with them for you to, at that point to take a take a pause and step away yeah and we you know as parents we're very over invested because we just love them so much that we can't bear them to feel any of those big horrible emotions yeah oh. so one of the things that we'll do in this episode in the footnotes is also put some links in there on your recommendation of people that they might yeah. be able to reach out to mm. but obviously you've got your fantastic teen tips which i have to say is an amazing resource can you explain a little bit more about how people can find yeah, that yeah. and and how what the process is absolutely so teen tips t-w-n-t-i-p-s.co.uk and we have launched over the last year a, a well-being hub for schools but parents can join individually so if your school's a member then you can have free access to it and it really does give you a huge library of resources whether that's parenting courses staff training courses live q and a's they can find a specialist they can jump on for a live q and a every tuesday evening we just you can just jump on and ask any question you want um and we do a monthly webinar which for hub members is free so the next one is going to be self-harm and then the one after that is body image one of the things that i really like about this platform as well is that it gives that sense of community that you're not alone and i think when things are really big and are happening particularly again in the last year and a half where we spent a lot of time with our family in the same four walls you can feel like it's only you that's experiencing it and also as a parent if things are going wrong with our children the kind of knee-jerk reaction is it's all my fault what have i done and actually, it's really nice to go into a community where you can sort of be honest and share and hear other people's stories and know that you're not alone. And, and, and they're all surmountable. Because again, when we keep it in our minds and in the falls, sometimes it becomes a monster that it actually isn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's like anything. The more you talk, the more you can rationalise. Absolutely. Oh, but Alicia, it's been so lovely to speak to you. Oh. And... I was so busy listening <laughs> to what you were saying as a parent um, that I'm going to have to try and jot it down and make sure that I don't forget. But it's been so interesting and I really am sure that a lot of the information that you've shared will be really helpful for people listening as well. So thank you so much for your time. Well, it's a huge privilege to be invited. So thank you very much for having me. We hope you enjoyed that conversation. Please do let us know what you thought. Rate us on iTunes, follow us, share, and spread the word with others. This has been a Wild Nutrition podcast with Henrietta Norton. It's produced by Phil Bodger. Special thanks to Nina Humphreys, who composed our theme tune, and everyone at Wild Nutrition for their support. You can subscribe to Wild Nutrition podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. And you can also find us on our website, wildnutrition.com. Mm-hmm.